doing case study number five of a student that is in the process of recovering from multiple sclerosis. Is it possible to recover from MS? Absolutely. I have been living MS free for the past over 30 years now. And we have many students that are working through the Live Disease Free Academy. And what I'd like to share with you today is one of our students journey what she's been doing, what she's been experiencing. And I really hope that this inspires you to take action and to really understand that there is hope for you if maybe you're dealing with MS or another chronic disease, that by treating the cause, you can recover, you can get your health and your life back, and you can enjoy an amazing life. So without further ado, I'm going to head over to my slides because I'd like to show you step by step what she's been doing. And what I'd also like you to do is to please make sure if you know other people that are looking for answers, they want to recover from multiple sclerosis or another disease, maybe you just enjoy my trainings, please share and like this video and we're going to get started right away because it's nice to share this, this information. I really want to get the word out so that people understand that there is hope for them. All right, so over to my slides. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pam Bartha and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And I was diagnosed, clinically diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 30 years ago. By the grace of God and work on my part, I learned very early on that infections were causing all the symptoms and the disease I was suffering with. And as I treated those infections, I recovered and I've been able to live MS free for over 30 years without any MS medications. And I've had the amazing privilege to coach over 700 students in the Live Disease Free Academy. So we've built a plan, a plan of action, and this is where students get ready to treat and then they treat. And I just, before I get started, I wanna give you kind of an overview. Hi, you guys, I can see you there. So in order to treat these infections, we first of all have to prepare. We have to go through the prep phase. So we have to change our diet because carbohydrates feed these infections. So as we decrease the carbs, we eat a nutritional eating plan, but we decrease the carbs, we notice that symptom improvements start. And you'll see with the student, then we get, uh, then we support the body. And then we go into the treatment phase. And then we treat several cycles and then once our health is back, we still want to treat parasites at least once a year, maybe twice a year, to make sure we never end up in this position again. So with further, without, uh, let's see, here we go. There we go. So case study number five. So this is a student who has just recently graduated through our Live Disease Free Academy, which is a 90-day online program with lots of support. So what she did is she has a members area where she can get the step-by-step -step plan, but then we have weekly calls. I love them. They're kind of like a mastermind call, not only helping the students to have a lot of clarity with where they're at and what they need to do and really understanding the process to a much deeper level, but also all these other crazy things we're dealing with in the world today. So they have a lot of peace and confidence and they have the information they need to make the right decisions for them in this time that we're living in. So she's 63 years young, married and has uh, two grown uh, daughters. She's retired. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2001. She also had low thyroid and Renaud's disease that's with uh, decreased circulation and Symptoms, poor balance, poor digestion, uh, and constipation, pain, fatigue, that's very, very common with MS, weakness in legs, bladder issues, mobility impacted, she was using a cane. So around the house, she could still walk, but anytime she wanted to go shopping or get out, she would use a cane. And she chose not to use multiple sclerosis medication. So when people come to us and they join, some people have been using disease modifying drugs for years and others have made that choice not to. So it's important for you to know that there are a lot of people out there that just, they've looked at the disease modifying drugs for MS and they just are not comfortable with the adverse effects. They don't believe that that is the answer and they've made that decision themselves. It has nothing to do with me. So she tried a few things in the past before she found me. She tried physiotherapy and chiropractor 
exercise. She also did CCSVI, which is where they open up the veins to increase the blood flow. And that is supposed to be helpful for MS. But honestly, I've spoken to thousands of people that have MS by now. And I yet haven't found one person that has had long lasting benefits from CCSVI. Sometimes they'll have very, not all the time, but sometimes they'll have short term benefits, but they usually disappear after a while. And not everyone gets CCSVI, just a very small percentage of the MS community would use as CCSVI. And she had no long lasting benefits, no real benefits from anything that she's tried in the past. And how the MS impacted her life, she was quite an active person before the MS. And a lot of people are. A lot of people were, you know, like professional dancers or soccer players, bike riders, sports, etc. They're not couch potatoes. That's really important to understand. It's not only just sickly people that get sick. And that is why it really helps us to understand when we know the cause, then it makes sense. Okay, that's why I was so I thought I was so healthy and you are, but we're out of balance with the microbes in our body. And when that's the case, those microbes make us become disabled and they make us sick. So she wasn't able to do things like skiing and playing soccer and she loved to do dragon boat racing, riding a bike and golfing. So she could golf, but she had to use the cart to get up to the place and um, just to get around. So that's what her life was like before she joined the academy. She was also on a couple of medications. So she decided not to use MS drugs, but she was using some different types of hormones. And the, I just wanna pause here for a minute because in my humble opinion, and I'm not a doctor, but what I have observed in my students that are using hormone replacement therapy or they're any type of synthetic or even bioidentical hormones, they may feel a little better while they're using them, but in time, it actually makes these infections worse because these hormones are changing the biochemistry in our body in ways we don't understand, which can actually make the, the infections benefit from it. So for example, when we take synthetic hormones, we can see an increase in our blood sugar level. And remember the parasites, they love sugar. So more sugar in the blood means they're fed better. And then also these hormones will decrease the inflammatory immune response. So that's like the fighting mechanism of our immune system. It's dampening that. So with that, we find that with just those two things, and there's probably other factors in time when we're using hormones, then it actually, we end up having our disease progressing more quickly. That's what I have observed. So women can end up with fibroid cysts, endometriosis, inflammatory conditions like arthritis, and even whatever they're dealing with, cancer, MS, other diseases, they seem, it just seems to make matters worse. And the important thing to understand is that a lot of people, women, they're told, like they have these symptoms, and especially around the menstrual, the change in hormones, we get all these symptoms and we think that it's our hormones that are out of balance. And whenever a lady, a, a, a student will work with me, and she's dealing with that. She's like, oh, I'm premenopausal or PMS, whatever the issue is. And then I'll say to her, it's usually infections that are causing this. So in certain times of the month where, for example, progesterone is higher, then things like the blood sugar level can be higher and the inflammatory immune response is a little lower. And this would be the pregnancy hormone where when we have children or babies, and so it's important that hormone, <clears throat> it sets the stage for pregnancy, but if we are out of balance with our microbes, then it also will benefit the microbes, the, the parasites. So at that time of the month, we get more symptoms and what it is, it's not really our hormones that's the problem, is that the infections are more active at that time. So when, the, when our students, the female students, when they treat these infections, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I guess you're right, because I just got my periods and I didn't get any symptoms, or I don't have these day, day um, sweats, night sweats, flushes, horm uh, mood shifts, etc. They don't have that anymore. So it's really important to understand that more than likely, it's not hormones. It is that your microbiome or your microbiota is really out of balance. And at certain times of the month, those critters are a lot more active 
and they cause a lot of grief for us. So what I always say to my students when they join and when she joined is that, you know, this is the situation with taking hormones. And so she, and so what our students will do is they'll talk with their doctor, they'll make a decision and they go off of the hormones and that really helps them to recover more quickly. So they work with their doctor. I never tell students to come off any medications. That's between them and their doctor. But normally our students don't have that background information so they can't make that wise, wise decision. Uh, she was also on Advil, I'm sure for pain, the pain she was dealing with. And again, Advil, obviously if we have unrelenting pain and we can't sleep, if we don't sleep, we won't heal, but we need to address the cause of our pain because Advil also suppresses our immune system, which will make the infections benefit in time. So it's something we don't wanna use for a long-term crutch. Supplements, omega-3 and vitamin D3, those are fine for her to continue taking, but that's what she was taking before. We always look at the health history of our students and it's not really a health history, it's kind of like a history of medical intervention and conditions or things they've had to deal with more like disease history and so when she was young early like 10 12 she had bladder infections she had ear infections so that so this is part of the journey of the student to really understand how they got to this place with illness if we understand why we got sick we can make sure we never end up in that position again and that's really important so she was able to look back at her health history the health history of her parents and see that wow when i was 10 to 12 i had recurrent bladder and ear infections so i was on antibiotics at that time so that would have already really put me out of balance it would have decreased the health promoting microbes and increased or allowed the disease causing microbes to flourish because I, she, her natural defense was compromised at that time. The good guys, the health promoting microbes were compromised. So the, the bad microbes that are left over, the disease causing microbes, they now have lots of room to grow. I share that in my, in my trainings. At 16, she broke her arm, which is not great, but it's not the biggest assault on her health, but definitely a trauma for sure. And then at the age of 18 to 25, she was using the birth control pill. So when she was young, she was on antibiotics, which put her microbiome out of balance. And then typically with our North American diet, we usually eat too many carbs, too much sugar. So that feeds the bad microbes. Then we go on the birth control or some type of hormone. And then remember I talked about how that really helps the microbes to become a problem more quickly. She also had nasal polyps. And so that is a warning sign that she's getting infections in her sinuses. And very often fungus loves to live in the sinuses. In my book, Become a Wellness Champion, I put uh, listed a study there where, I think it was the Mayo Clinic, and they looked at 200 uh, patients. And from the 200 patients, they found that the vast majority, it was like 99% of them that had allergic rhinitis, sinus issues that it was all fungal based so what happens is fungus really likes to set up camp there and then we have like we become congested and back secondary bacterial infections can be a problem but a lot of it is fungal overgrowth so that's a little her body's giving her a warning sign it's like hey these infections are starting to show up where they shouldn't she had a collapsed lung at the age of 21 22 she had a cyst removed from her left hand so that a cyst is again a pocket of infection your body is containing something it might have been a parasite it might have been and when i say parasite it could be worm it could be protist it could be fungi they're all microbes that live off of us live off of our food so they would all be considered parasites so the cyst is the body's way of containing infection and so that was removed then at 26 she had her the birth of her first daughter 27 started having thyroid issues and we know that when there is a lot of dysbiosis in the gut where we're really out of balance in the gut a lot of us can have low thyroid thyroid issues so she was treated for that she had a miscarriage a year later so that again her body is saying hey i'm not able to carry the baby well enough um, just with the state of her health shingles at the age of 28 that's another sign it's like another warning sign it's like hey i need help here i'm not able to deal with shingles on the right side of her face and then 29 she had her second daughter diagnosed with ms at 44 so she actually was able to hold it back maybe 
just circumstances in her life, maybe her lifestyle, where she ate a little healthier than some of us, and maybe she was able to manage stress a little bit better than some of us. But at the age of 44, she developed or was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And then she had a few other issues, um, maybe for heavy mens menses, she had the ablation and shingles again at 58 on the left side of her face. And before she started working with me, she was also seeing a rheumatologist uh, with another, she was dealing with dry mouth and dry eyes, Sjogren's syndrome, that's what they thought it was. So that's where she was at when she started, or I should say that was her history and her health when she started. So when she started, we all start with the Live Disease Free Eating Plan. We, the students all learn that first. And what it is, is it's getting the total grams of carbs down to about 35 to 40. And it takes a little bit of practice. It's not like there are certain foods that I always say you can eat, but we have to eat in a way that there are certain foods we would have as a garnish. So things like carrots and peppers, tomatoes, avocados, things that are a little higher in carb, we would have them as a garnish. But we have a lot of low carb vegetables. And when we have a lot of low carb vegetables, moderate amounts of protein, enough healthy fat to maintain our weight, then we notice that as we get into that target zone of 35 to 40, we see that the inflammation starts to go down and we start to have a lot of symptom improvements. And so as she was starting to learn in the first, and I would say with, like I've been teaching for a long time, since 2020, which is a long time. So first as a high school math and science teacher, coaching on the side, but in the last, I would say close to 10 years, full-time coaching students in, in recovering from chronic disease. And my students are all different. Some of them are, you know, they're communicating more. Some of them are more independent. So she was a little bit more independent. So sometimes I get a lot of contact week by week, uh, but she was, a lot was going on in her life too. But she did an amazing job, and that's why I want to showcase you. So sh showcase her. So in week one to three, she was learning the eating plan. So this is the prep phase. She was following the eating plan, sent me her lesson on activity. I gave her feedback. Some of the things I noted was that make sure you have your small serving of the low sugar fruit, lower sugar fruit, first thing in the morning by itself 30 minutes before a meal because that really helps it to digest well, and then it doesn't ferment, which means that the bad microbes are feasting on it. And then making sure to have protein with every meal. So if we just have low carb vegetables and healthy fats, we'll be starving in a half an hour or an hour. So making sure to have the adequate animal protein with each meal with our nine to 13 servings of vegetables. She was still eating oatmeal, so I guess she missed that in the notes, but we go off of all grains. And she had chicken chop suey probably from uh, a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, but it's really important that even if we say no noodles, no rice, that we don't eat in those kind of restaurants in the recovery phase because they usually have maybe a little bit of cornstarch in a little bit of thickener or a tiny bit of soy sauce or even contamination of soy sauce. And those very small amounts of contamination will really, will feel it until we start to decrease the infection. So and then cauliflower mash, that is something that I say the students can have on Thanksgiving or Christmas Day, just a small serving, but we wouldn't have it like often and a large amount because even cauliflower, although we can have it, when we grind it up and we have a lot of it, that again processes these carbs that are in the cauliflower and condenses them and then we can find that's why it's really important for our students to look at the chronometer which is a free app on their phone and to measure for a day or two not all the time but maybe on a weekend day that they're not as busy to just see like am I really in the 35 to 40 oh yeah I'm right there or oh my gosh I thought I was but I'm over 50 so we would avoid the cauliflower mash at the beginning um, or having very small amounts and Again, if she was considering that with a chronometer, so I said, be careful with that. Another thing that we've learned as we've worked with so many students is that the soups and broths can be a problem, not for everyone, but for some people, yes. So if somebody is having soup occasionally, that's homemade broth from the carcass of uh, chickens or maybe beef broth from bones that they've made themselves. You know for sure that there's nothing in it except for the water and the 
maybe a couple of vegetables like onion and carrot and celery, salt and pepper and the bones, it's fine if they are improving. But we have seen over and over and over again that people that have bone broth regularly or soups regularly, a lot of times they just don't move forward like the other students. Why is that? That, is, that could be because some of the microbes that are causing the symptoms, if they feed off of bone broth, and we know that in the lab when they're trying to culture certain bacteria, that very often broth is part of the culture media, what they grow it on. So if the microbes are feasting off of it, they will benefit and we will pay for it. And then also with collagen, we know that if we have the vector-borne infections of Lyme disease, which is very common with multiple sclerosis, Lyme loves collagen. That I learned that from Dr. Klinghardt. And so it's important to really listen to the body. And if you're having occasional homemade soup and you're just moving forward like this student did, it's fine. But if you're finding that you're having soup often, and I personally would not be drinking bone broth or collagen regularly, not in until you are back in balance. And I know that's counterintuitive because the bone broth has a lot of minerals and all kind of collagen and all kinds of wonderful things, amino acids that are great for us if it's not feeding an infection that's making us disabled. That is the key. So that's something that we've learned and I've seen it over and over again. So I just wanted to share that. So those are some of the feedback items that I gave her. She also had a lot of constipation and that's very common with our students since she was a teenager, so young. And myself too, before I was diagnosed with MS, I remember being as a young child constipated for years. So a lot of us have these parasites for years before we end up with the disease label, whether it's MS, PLS, Parkinson's, et cetera. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to share too is that she could not afford to lose weight. So some of our students are overweight and when they start the eating plan, they're very happy to lose a few pounds. But some of our students, like myself, we don't want to lose weight. And so this is where I help our students really make sure they're getting enough calories. If they're eating more calories than they are burning, they will gain weight. If they're eating less calories than their body burns, they will lose weight. So we wanna make sure that they're at least eating the same amount of calories as they are burning, as their body is using for energy. And with our students is that with the calories, you can get calories from carbohydrates, fats, or protein. And we're decreasing the carbs and we're increasing the healthy fats. So that's what we're doing. So we're decreasing the carbs, but fat calories give us a lot of calories and energy. And so we're increasing the fat calories. So she started to change her eating plan. And she said that my eating plan and menu ha is much more exciting and it's improving every week. I'm buying a variety of meats and fish, eating at least nine servings of low carb vegetables. And I prepared a few of my own recipes and found some more on the internet. And that's really my goal is to help people to equip them so they don't have to rely on one recipe book that they can just take healthy meals that are somewhat close to the eating plan and just maybe omit one or two things. And so that's what she was doing. And she sent us some great recipes too that she found that she really enjoyed. And so already in just over a month, this is what she was noticing. I have a lot more energy following this new eating plan, which is great. I only have to nap once in the afternoon in the past two weeks, which is a really big improvement. The numbness in my left leg from my knee to my foot has improved when I walk and I can feel the muscles engage and the skin is more sensitive to the touch, which is a, that's in a good way. So she's getting more feeling back and that's just after a month. That is the power of the Live Disease-Free Eating Plan. And again, the big power of it is just learning how to get the total grams of carbs down so that inflammation starts. So her inflammation was starting to go down. And the exciting thing is that when we've had numbness, for example, for a long, long time, we can get feeling back. So these are, it's helping us to see, these amazing case studies are helping us to see that there is so much recovery that we can have that we didn't think that was possible. So by week six, um, she was still making some minor adjustments to her eating plan. So she is an A-type 
student where she's constantly trying to implement better and better and better. And those are the people that get the best results. Those are the ones that are just, you know, what can I do better? What can I do better? And they end up having more improvements. So then by week six, she was ready to treat. And usually our students are ready to treat within the first three to six weeks. So her, for her, it was a little bit longer uh, because she had a lot going on in her personal life. And we'll get to that in a minute. So at this place where she followed the prep phase successfully, she was having a lot of improvement in her energy. She was having a lot of improvement in neurological symptoms. So that's what I want to see as a coach. I want to see that and she's having daily bowel movements and she's sleeping well and she's made the adjustments to the medications with her doctor. And all of that is important, looking at her blood work and making sure her physiology is in good shape, like her thyroid, her B12, her iron and all those things, looking at liver and kidney function, teaching her how to read her blood work. So all those things are important. And then she's at the place where she's start ready to treat. And this is at lesson three. And so th at that point, we have resource pages in the members area where she's learning about parasites and fungus and, and traditionally how they're treated. And also the oxidizing agent where we can do enemas and we can help to clear out the parasites a little quicker out of the large intestines. So she's this in this Live Disease Free Academy, the students are learning how to play an active role in their recovery. There's so much they can do. What does that do? It saves them a lot of time and a lot of money. If we just go to a doctor, if we're lucky enough to find a practitioner by ourselves who we, who's knowledgeable at recognizing and treating parasites, very often they're not getting us to do all these other things that we can do that will make these treatments work so much better, so much more effectively. And that is what they do in the academy. And that is so important. In my generation, we always thought you just go to your doctor and they fix you. But what I learned is that that my health is my responsibility and I have to play the most important role in my health care. And when you do that, you can recover, you can have an amazing, amazing life. So she was also looking for the practitioner. So now she's ready to build her plan. And that means understanding the different treatments and, and then also being able to know how to find a practitioner that will help her test to see which of the treatments are most effective for her and that would be through energy testing. So we don't have good stool tests. We are working on it. We're working with a, a group, which we're moving forward, getting research, and we want to get better testing and protocols, but that's going to take time. So people want to get better now. So they're finding practitioners that will energy test them. So they'll take samples, like one dose of the most commonly prescribed parasite drugs, and they will go to a practitioner that does either advanced muscle testing like ART, Maybe they're using a machine like a Vega machine or EAV machine, et cetera, or an AMA machine like Dr. Simon Yu. So there's all these different machines that, and also just muscle testing that help. They'll bring the dose into our energy field. So this is biophysics and it's, it has to be a practitioner. It has to be somebody who has a lot of experience in physiology and they use energy testing in their practice all the time and they have a good referral track record also. So you they put the energy the the sample in our energy field whether it's on a little plate or whether it's held up against us and then they test our energy through either muscle testing or through like sometimes it looks like a little uh, metal pen and they just touch an acupuncture point touching it. And that'll tell the machine will either show that it strengthens us, balances us or it does nothing. And that way they can say, okay, this one, yes, that one, no, 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 yes, this one. And it's been really helpful for our students to kind of hone in. Otherwise, it's complete trial and error. So it helps them to hone in and then the doctor can write the prescription. So that's where she was at at week six. And then she shared in week eight, and this helped me to understand why she was communicating with me, but she was not needing as much attention as some of the other students. And she said, I've had a lot of personal challenges in the past couple of months. So one of her, her dog died. They had it for 12 years and that can be really awful. One of her friends was going through a, a, a very serious autoimmune condition diagnosis and she was helping her. And then of course she's a mom and she was helping her kids with renos and um, helping them to stay with them, et cetera. So she has a really a lot going on. And so she was still 
which I, this is the wellness champions. They are so committed. So even with all the stuff going on in her life, she made this a priority. And how do I know that? Because of her symptom improvements. That's the bottom line is when I see people improving, they're following it, whether they have to be super efficient, etc. So she also noticed in her health history that she was fed formula and she was very colicky. So you can tell already when she was a baby that she was out of balance. So it'd be really interesting uh, to know a little bit more if she, if something happened. Sometimes we have traumatic childbirth too, or maybe her mom, as she was, if she was born through the birth canal of her mother, maybe she picked up too many of the wrong microbes in the birth canal. And that is what happened with me also. I was very fussy as a young child also. So she, they were trying to give her special formulas, et cetera, because she, and she couldn't drink milk, et cetera, cow's milk. And she realized, and the students do too, that when we have chronic disease, we have severe dysbiosis, meaning we're really, really out of balance. We have far too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes. The power of this lesson too is that she really understand how she got sick, what things happened in her life to bring her to that place. So by week eight, which is just about two, close to two months into the journey in the academy, she shared, I've been exercising three to four times a week, I have a lot more energy, no more, don't need naps anymore. Um, I have, oh, if I have a short, or sorry, if I have a short quick stop to make when I'm shopping, I don't use my cane, which is awesome. My left ankle was swollen most of the time before uh, following the eating plan, but now it's almost back to normal. I am very happy with my improvement. So already her mobility is improving so significantly that she can go into the stores without her cane uh, for short distances. And this is huge because she has not started to treat the parasites yet. She was started, well, let me put it this way. She, go to this slide. So she would start, um, when you get to the place of ready to treat, then a lot of students will, they'll start with antimicrobial herbs and they might do the enemas. They might take raw garlic and you have to be careful with raw garlic because sometimes students find that they deal with angry worm syndrome. So if you take too much too quickly, you can kind of aggravate the parasites and you don't feel well, you stop recover. So they have to introduce that slowly. So at that place that if she was doing anything, like by week 13, this is where um, she was starting to use the oxidizing enemas and she shared, uh, so week 13, I started treating two weeks ago and I'm journaling, um, journaling. The enemas work really well. One day I saw one worm very clearly in the toilet bowl and within an hour or two during my next bathroom stop, I passed a large group of worms in clear liquid. So that's water from the enema. And I shared this with my husband and my daughter and they were really amazed. My emotions have been all over the place until now. I will continue to make changes, stay focused and succeed. So it's, I didn't get the pictures from her. Some of the students, I've shared tons of worm pictures with, if you wanna watch some of my other videos. Some students like to take them out of the toilet and lay them out and take pictures and measure them. Other students are just like, good riddance. I don't wanna see you ever again. So they don't bother pulling or taking pictures. So by week 14, she said, I've moved fo forward slowly, but consistently over the past two months. When I was just following the eating plan, I noticed that my energy improved and I was walking better. So her mobility improved also. I did not need to use my cane for short distances anymore. And now I'm treating the parasites. Twice a week now, so this is at 14 weeks, Twice a week, I walk my da daughter's dog to the park and back without a cane. And the distance is about one mile. In the past, my left foot would drop, causing me to trip. Now I'm walking properly with my heel first and then my toe. So a lot of us with MS, we have foot drop. And now she can move her ankle and she can do heel to toe again, which is awesome. The muscles are getting stronger in my feet and my ankles. This is such a new feeling for me. I will meet with a physiotherapist to help me with exercise and muscle strengthening. So that is a really good thing. And that is what I call taking back our mobility. So as our muscles start to work again, as the inflammation goes down and we get our mobility back, we've lost a lot of muscle mass. So we have to start to exercise and we have to take back our mobility. 
P.S. I couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. And then I had one more recent update, which is just a couple of weeks ago. I'm doing very well. Walking has continued to improve. My toenails on my right foot were a problem for a long time. They were getting thicker and I thought it was my age. And now I, let me just move myself over here so you guys can read this better. There we go. So I have now completed one round of parasite and fungal treatment. And I am happy to say that my toenails have improved significantly. I am ready for sandal weather. And she's going to be doing a liver gallbladder flush. So the students normally will do those, but they'll do them when they're feeling better, when they're feeling stronger. I'm very happy with the Live Disease Free Academy, and I would love to share my successes with others. I'm planning to golf with my girlfriends on Monday. Walking is so much easier than in the past. Awesome. You've been such a huge impact on my life. And yes, I will continue to inspire her to becoming a better version of herself. Absolutely. That is my absolute joy. So I'm so tickled pink with her success. So this helps you to see what is possible to achieve in just three months or just over three months. And that is with her not even starting to treat at least until six weeks in. And some students are ready in three weeks because they don't have all the personal things going on and they just are ready to treat a little bit earlier. Okay, so I am going to go to your questions for a moment here. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, uh, Jenia. Hi, Facebook user. I'm not sure who you are. Hi, Stephanie. You find that hard to believe. Well, Stephanie, I really hope that you look at the other case studies. We also have students that have shared their successes on YouTube, Live Disease Free, but also on our website, livediseasefree.com, that many of them were more disabled. So for example, Terry Kylie, she hadn't walked for at least seven years. She was in a scooter and in three months, she was able to start using crutches because she had to build back her leg muscles. So this is possible. And I can never promise, but all I can say is that we have a proven system, we have a proven plan. And when you implement it well, and it's really important to get guidance, and the shift, the difference is that this is not just a diet and not just exercise. It's treating what's causing the neurological symptoms, which are parasites. And parasites can be worms, they can be like single celled protists, they can be bacteria, they can be fungi, critters that make us disabled, that eat carbs and produce poisons and cause a lot of immune response, trying to fight them. And by the time we have chronic disease, we are really out of balance and our immune system is overtaxed, overburdened. And as we start to clear them away, we get our life back. So I hope, Stephanie, that that gives you some hope. Hi, Shauna. Hi, Valerie. So I think it's Tabi, Tabe. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Hopefully I didn't butcher it. Do you think only parasites can cause this? Susan Owens, um, the autism researcher and practitioner who had MS, doctors thought she had MS, but she found it was a history of extreme oxalate diet. I can honestly say that that is not the case. Um, we've worked with over 700. What I can say is that for her, maybe being sensitive to the, the oxalic acid in certain foods, as she decreased that and probably was fairly health conscious and eating really healthy, that it took the edge off of it but it's still parasites, it's still infections. And what happens is we might have a little bit of a few years that are better, but we end up with problems with it again because the infections will become more active again because life happens. We end up in stressful situations. We might not eat the right foods. We may end up, the, the infections move into the bladder and they also impact nerves that affect the bladder. So we can end up with bladder issues and going on antibiotics. So there are many factors, lack of sleep. We, a lot of us have insomnia, so we don't sleep. And all these factors will make our immune system weaker. With a weaker immune system, then we end up having these infections more active, and then we get another MS attack. It's not just diet alone. Go ahead and try it. You'll see that it is not the answer. I don't recommend large amounts of uh, spinach for sure. And 
Yes, well, zinc is great. Um, it's it's helpful for our immune system. It's helpful to lower the risk of viruses, etc. And and the B six people can try those, but that's not what's causing the problem. The co- what the cause is is infection. And if this is new to you, then go and watch our playlist. The we have a playlist of M- the infections that cause MS. So go and watch those. You'll see there's tons of evidence. There's tons of research. When we have chronic disease, it's not enough just to change our diet. You can try, but you'll see a lot of the people that I work with, they've invested a lot of money in their health working with different practitioners. They've tried all kinds of diets, and that is alone is not going to get them well. It is the first step. Eating plan is the first step. It's vital. If you don't change your eating plan, if you keep feeding the infections, you definitely will not have success. But if you don't want to carry the burden of infection and run the risk of having, I'll just move myself over here because I'm done, I believe. Let's see with these slides. Oh, yes, I am. I am. So I'm going to head over here so you guys can see me better. So the key is that If we want the highest quality of life, we have to learn how to correct the microbiome well enough. And that is really anti-aging. It makes you feel like you're 20 years younger as you decrease the disease-causing microbes and you increase the health-promoting microbes and you learn how to manage them for the rest of your life. And again, go to our Live Disease Free YouTube and on YouTube. We have the playlist of infections that cause MS and you can watch that. And we have a bunch of studies listed on our website, livediseasefree.com, under research. Thank you guys for sharing this. Please help us get the word out. We want, we want it to be known very well that these infections are causing MS because that's the only way things are going to change with MS. Um, and so with Advil, again, Advil does suppress the immune system. Absolutely, it does. If you are dealing with terrible, terrible pain, let's say you had surgery or you had an accident, to use it for a day or two is fine. But to live on it, you have to understand it is suppressing your immune system. That is why you're getting pain relief because the pain molecules are part of the response of the immune system. And yes, Sjogren's can definitely be worse with the um, uh, diet high in oxalic acid. But just so you know, Tabe, or I hope I pronounced your name correctly, is that this student did not take spinach out. We don't focus on that in the eating plan. And also some people think lectins would be a problem. So I just say don't eat spinach every day, three times a day, uh, if you have it once every couple of days. But we don't worry about other foods with lectins and oxalates, just so you know that. Hello, Abu. Your daughter, who's nine years old, has an autoimmune arthritis. And so this is where you should reach out to us. I don't know if you printed off the cheat sheet. You'll find that in the Live Disease Free community. There is a cheat sheet. And she just has to make sure that she is increasing, like she's getting enough calories. And that's the thing is you have to make sure she's not constipated, that she's having daily bowel movements. She's getting enough calories, so I'm not, I don't know anything about her, nine years old, so she's pretty young. Um, so with her, you need to work with someone. You definitely need to work with someone to help her. Um, with kids, it's a little bit different for sure. Hi, Dawn. So great to see you there. Your daughter was ART tested, found parasites. Yeah, so definitely you'll want to, whoever you were working with, you definitely want to get her treated. Um, so with this, again, you have to work with a practitioner. So it depends on what type of parasite she has as to what kind of treatments and she's a child. So this is where, you know, uh, drugs that will go through the whole system, they may not be appropriate for her. That works systemically. You have to be very careful with children. That's why you have to work with somebody for sure. Hi, Kaylin. So are there other things being treated other than parasites, Lyme? Well, back to the Borrelia is a parasite. So a parasite isn't just a worm. A parasite is anything that any microbe that's living in us that is living off of nutrients we have 
it's a freeloader and it's causing us harm. So Borrelia, which is the, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, but with MS, there's also Babesia that's very common with MS. So there are, there's a whole cluster of different infections that travel together called Lyme disease. There's probably, I don't know, maybe around 10. And so we can have Ehrlichia, Bartonella, Babesia, Borrelia, etc. And so as, yes, they would be considered parasites too. And we do deal with heavy metals. So in the academy, we use a holistic approach, but we don't treat heavy metals until students are feeling better. So they first, they are eating in a way that is feeding their body, but greatly reducing the food to the infections. And then they are supporting their body. They're sleeping well. They're having daily bowel movements. They're having a lot of symptom improvement. And then they start treating and then they have the significant symptom improvement with mobility and becoming symptom free. Then they're doing things like the heavy metal detox. Then they will be doing things like gallbladder and liver flush because sometimes the parasites are coming in through the gallbladder liver meridian. So it's a step-by-step -step plan. We're not doing the heavy metal detox when people are really sick and fragile. How do you get rid of parasites? We love herbs, antimicrobial parasite herbs, but they're just not strong enough on their own. So we're using a combination of usually three to five parasite drugs that our students are testing well for. And then they're also using herbs, anti-parasite herbs, and the oxidizing agent, which is working on a different angle. So the combination of all three, while they are following the eating plan, while they've supported the body, that is how they're seeing such significant symptom improvements and they're more successful. And they have to do it for several cycles. So if someone doesn't have chronic disease, they might just have to do like three or four cycles. Maybe they just have irritable bowel or gut issues. So they would do maybe three or four cycles. You wanna do a couple of treatment cycles past for sure past when you're completely symptom free because we know that some of these worms can lay a hundred thousand eggs at one time there are biofilms that the eggs and the larvae the immature forms they hide under and so we have to help break up the biofilms and expose them and allow them to hatch over a few cycles and just keep hitting them and hitting them so it is quite a process but it works and this is the result so i just this is the fifth case study i've shared Four of them were for multiple sclerosis and one of the students is that was dealing with PLS and she is, last I heard from her, she was 70% better. And that is an incurable disease also. This is not just true for MS. So one of our students, we attract students that just have, you know, they just can't get better. So this one student doesn't have MS and she, just a young lady, when she came to me, she's on a carnivore diet couldn't eat anything else because everything would cause extreme diarrhea and extreme stomach pain. Went to all the doctors, went to the naturopathic physicians, all the integrated practitioners, couldn't get better. And then she just followed the steps. So she stopped, well, she wasn't, she couldn't change. So she had to follow the carnivore diet. She was just eating beef and beef fat and that was it. And then she just did all the other prepping and two days into treating, she was able to eat at least five different foods again. And, she, and now I just got an update from her and that's probably about a year ago and she's doing really well and she's able to do all kinds of organizational things and um, she's just got a lot of energy back and she can eat foods again. What a joy to be able to eat different foods again. So there is, it's really sad because this makes so much common sense that parasites or that our microbes are so out of balance it's so simple and it makes sense because all of us that have chronic disease we know that our gut is off that we're dealing with gas constipation we have cravings all of those things and so when people find out it's like what infection that makes so much sense I was on antibiotics when I was a kid probably too many I've had gut issues. Some people, have, a lot of people have shared to me, I've seen, I've passed worms and they weren't trying to kill them, but maybe one died and they just came out. So this makes a lot of sense to people. And this is the only direction that we will go in if we want to recover is to everything that we do to focus it around treating the cause, which are the infections. And that's what we help people to do. A couple last questions here. Your mom has MS and she's also following the eating plan and she's seeing progress. I'm so happy about that. That's so awesome. 
Yes, Anita, you are one of my heroes. Absolutely. Um, that is actually Anita that um, she's just sharing. Thank you. Um, I think you're talking about me. <laughs> and so she just shared, I played three full games of golf since we talked last. And on the Fitbit, it shows 9,000 steps with each game of golf. Yay. Okay, Anita, one thing, just so you know that the Fitbit is giving you electromagnetic radiation and so that's not a good thing so it's awesome that is counting your steps i'm awesome that you did 9,000 steps but that is something you don't want to wear in your body because that is giving you wireless radiation while you're wearing it i didn't know you were wearing that so awesome but thank you so much for sharing that is amazing so she's back to golfing and enjoying life that is so cool hi debbie hi laura lee uh, what type of enema is most beneficial so the oxidizing enema that we do in the in the program and i can't talk about it unfortunately on on youtube it's not allowed or facebook not on, on social media so hello i would really like to start streaming on my website and that is what i'm working towards i can be a little bit more open there which would be awesome hi judy so how do you start uh, that's a really good question i apologize for not sharing that earlier so if you'd like to find out more about the Live Disease Free Academy, then what you would do is we will have a link. It may not be in the feed yet, but all as soon as I'm done, we'll put the link in the feed of this video. And that's for my masterclass training. Watch that. It explains this whole process. A lot of case studies so that you can see a lot of other people that have had and their experiences. So you can see the possibilities for you. And then if you're ready, if you think that this makes so much sense and you want to treat infections and you'd like support, then you can join us in the academy. You can become a wellness champion and you're just going, there will be where my masterclass is. There's a little button and it says click for a free session with Pam. So to find out about the academy, that's only if you're interested in the academy. So you click on that, you'll get an email from us, watch the, the coachathon that explains all the details in the academy in great detail it's going to answer a lot of your questions and then you and i can meet to answer any last questions you have and sometimes students just listen to the coachathon and then they join but i still want to chat with you i still want to get to know you before we start this journey together to make sure that you know i understand what you've done where you've been what your goals are and just to welcome you so with that i'm gonna let you guys go i'll be back next wednesday five o'clock pacific on Live Disease for YouTube and Facebook. Take care and bye-bye for now.